Um, I'd like to start off the evening introducing the man that made all this possible. Uh, he's a visionary, a person that we all respect and look up to. And when we started the process for a while, I thought uh, this was going to be quite a, a difficult feat. But it's, it seemed pretty seamless, and it's working very well at the middle schools. Um, so I can't wait to get it at the high school next year. Our teachers are very excited, and our students can't wait. So I'd like to introduce at this time Dr. Peter Sanchioni. Good evening, nice to see everyone. So this evening we're gonna to talk to you about the one-to-one -one laptop program, grades eight through 12. As Rose has already mentioned, it's been in the eighth grade this year. We'll talk a little bit about that. It's coming to grades nine to 12 next year. You're gonna get a lot of logistical information, technical information, things you need to know as parents. I wanna to speak to you a moment why we're doing this. And I just want you to think about your son or daughter in the year of their graduation, whatever that year may be. And simply, this is about educational excellence, this is about mastery of content. See, I want you and your son and daughter to have as many choices as possible in April and May of their senior year. Whatever that may be, whether it's the best universities in the world, public colleges, world of work, military, whatever it may be, I want them to have choices to do whatever they want to pursue. See, right now in the history of the world, college is the most competitive it's ever been. We have more foreign students coming here. To get into colleges these days, you have to be excellent. And districts across the country have been involved in one-on-one -on -one initiatives for the last decade. See, here in New England, other than, the, other than the state of Maine, we're a little bit skeptical as New Englanders. We like to take our time, investigate, make sure it's the right thing to do. And I want to assure you that the native public schools have done just that. See, so we've visited districts in California, North Carolina, in New York, in Maine, in New Hampshire, and various other places to look at their research and data, to look at their implementation plan, and to make sure this was in fact what is best for the students who attend school here. Because it's a tool to help students master curriculum. We're not changing the curriculum, we're changing the way we deliver it, and we know that this tool will engage students in their learning. Now, a bit of scientific research. It's actually been proven that the students who are coming to public schools today's brains are different than yours and mine, unless some of you in the audience are 25 or less. And if you are, congratulations. In fact, students who have grown up with technology since they were two, three, four, five years old are used to receiving information a certain way. They're used to receiving the information, and no longer they don't want to receive it, but they want to manipulate it, they want to produce it, and they, want to, and they want to use it to give that information back to someone. It's very different than the population of students we've, we've educated in the last couple decades. And a laptop allows them to do that. It engages them in their learning. And some of the things we've learned from these districts that we've been to, and in our two middle schools, even in the short time we've had it in the eighth grade this year, I can say to you, if you speak to any one of our eighth grade teachers, they'll tell you, engagement is up, discipline is down. And more importantly, and I know it's a short sample, but we had more students make the honor roll in eighth grade this year compared to when they were in seventh grade last year in a more rigorous curriculum. So something's causing a change there positively for education. And again, when we look at these districts across the country, they've all demonstrated and documented increased gains in standardized test scores, increased gains in their, their state test. Students are doing better in school, it's just intuitive. If you're more engaged in learning, you're going to learn more, and when you learn more, you produce better results. And so it comes back to it's a technology initiative. We're going to talk to you about laptops. Dennis is going to explain to you how the system works and all the logistics. But I want you to remember it's an educational initiative. This is about putting your son and daughter in the best possible position when they're in April or May of their senior year to have as many choices as possible. We need to be competitive, and I feel this does this for our district. So we're proud to bring it here to Natick, and if you pass that big building on the street out there, it's gonna open as one of the most technologically advanced schools in the East Coast. It's gonna be the envy of schools in Massachusetts. And what makes it work, more than anything, is the staff that's in that building. We've spent the last three years training every high school teacher to work in a one-to-one -one environment. They've digitized their curriculum, they've created project-based learning activities for the students, 
They're ready to instruct in 78 minute blocks to engage students to again have them master the content that we know that will serve them well. So it's a very exciting time. And I hope you will partner with us because the key component to this right now is with working with you. We're gonna make sure these students take care of these machines, that we partner with you, that we make sure they're used correctly, that we don't have cyberbullying, negative acts taking place with these, with these machines. And that only works well when we have a partnership with our parents. So we ask you to engage with us, inform us of things that are going on so we're best prepared also. And when that happens, there's nothing but success in our, in our future. So it's been a pleasure. I'm glad you're here this evening. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to our tech director, Mr. Dennis Roach. Good evening, everyone. My name is Dennis Roach. I'm our technology director here at the Natick Public Schools. Uh, the format for tonight's presentation, we're going to go through a bunch of slides. You'll hear from myself, our high school principal, and our middle school principals. Uh, then we'll take uh, uh, questions and answers at the end. So I'm really going to get into a lot of the logistics in the program. The program that I'm presenting to you tonight is exactly the same for the eighth grade and for the high school. There are very few differences. The real difference, as you'll see, is how we deploy the laptops for the high school laptop rollout. Principal Bertucci will talk to you about a rollout that will happen prior to the first day of school in the month of August. And for the middle schools, we'll talk about a rollout that will happen actually in the classrooms in their homerooms at the middle schools. Uh, but specifically, the equipment I have shown on the board is exactly the same equipment we've given our teaching staff. So when we did our research in one-to-one -one initiatives, the key thing we found, the districts that minimize surprises and give teachers and students the same tools, the focus is on learning. The focus isn't on the tools, isn't on the technology. It's using, or using them as tools in the learning process. So every student will be getting a MacBook computer. Along with that MacBook computer, we also are bundling in a three-year warranty, which I'll talk a lot more about in a couple more slides ahead. We're also equipping a backup drive to back up all their data, a charger, and a protective bag. From a software perspective, here are some of our most common applications that we use within the school district. Uh, Google Apps for Education is a free suite of applications that Google gives us to use in education. It allows us to collaborate teachers and students uh, directly. The nice thing about the Google Apps app suite of applications that's different than, say, the Microsoft set of applications, it gives teachers and students the ability to be in the doc, the same document at the same time and edit and do things based on doing and working on projects together. Uh, we also use a district-wide email system as well. From an email perspective, we archive all email for faculty, staff, and students. For students, we archive email for a one-year period in case anything comes into question and we need to refer back to it. So people need to know that. For faculty and staff, we're obligated to, to archive that for a longer period of time, for seven years. We also use OpenOffice, which is another free open source alternative to Microsoft Office. Some parents had asked us questions whether Microsoft Office was going to be considered and we're looking into some options. One thing that Microsoft does offer free to education is an online hosted version of Microsoft Office, which we're exploring. So if anyone had questions about that, please stay tuned and we'll get you more information. In addition to that, we bundle in antivirus software, which we'll be updating on a regular basis. And we also use Moodle, which is our learning management system. It's a web-based system that teaches post um, curriculum and digital content to. And we also have the iLife suite, which is Apple's solution for creating multimedia type presentations. So those are really the core pieces of software we have in the program. From a technology perspective, we couldn't do a one-to-one -one program of making some back-end changes in our infrastructure to support all the devices out there. So there's really three key ones I wanted to talk to you briefly about tonight. One is our Google Wireless solution. We now have wireless in all of our schools today. Even this old building that's coming down in a couple of months has wireless in a few locations. The new high school will have it in every location. Our two middle schools have it building-wide, as well as all of our elementary schools now. Um, 
Our internet content filter is uh, changing to a company called Lightspeed for next year. We currently have a different provider for this year. Um, that's what's called a roaming content filter. And the beauty of that is regardless of where the student is with the laptop we give them, whether in school or at home or anywhere in between, as long as they get an internet connection, we can set filtering rules that will apply to that device. So it's a roaming internet filter, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And the last one is our Casper mobile device management suite. This is really one of the key things anytime you deal with a mobile deployment. It allows us to set policies, it allows us to push out software, probably much like you would imagine in your corporate environment. Your IT groups are able to automate deploying software very quickly. We use this to manage the devices in our environments as well. It also allows us to inventory them. Uh, kids are very smart and they find ways to install games. It's a way for us to actually identify a process that we don't like running in our environment and not allow it to run. So it's extremely effective in a school environment. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about that again on a future slide as well. So a couple of the other key protections we put in place is we don't allow students to install any software, so they don't have any local administrative rights to the machine. We do give administrative rights to our teaching staff because we want them to explore new options and new capabilities, but we don't want our students to do that. And we do that deliberately so that we don't want them installing games and doing other things and really dragging the laptop's performance down. And this is where the Casper suite comes in really handy because as a school district, we can approve certain software that they can go to a website, a self-service website, and install things even though they don't have administrative rights. So it's a neat way for us as a district to control the type of software students have access to. So from a web filtering perspective, as I mentioned, it's a roaming internet filter that falls in wherever they go. But a word of caution, any type of content filter you have is not perfect. Students will always find a way around certain things. And when I've looked at various Google searches that our students do in school, do you know what the number one search is? They're all searching for proxy servers, which is a key way to get around these types of things. Um, and we've actually been changing our filter this year because we found a more progressive filter that we've been using and it allows us much more granular control. Is anyone familiar with uh, Google Plus? Quick show of hands. So Google Plus is a social networking thing that Google came out with this year. And one issue we had in our school environment is that students were getting access to it. Now Google Plus is only available to people 18 years of age or older. And the way students were getting around this, we're not allowed as a K-12 district in our domain to even give that as an option. It's just not even an option for us to release. But what students were doing was signing up for free Google accounts, using a personal Google account, and applying about their age. And if that's the case, Google would not know they're about 18 and would allow them to create a Google Hangout and utilize the application. And our content filter wasn't smart enough to recognize the difference between, say, Gmail in Google Plus. It just thought it was all Google, which it is all Google, but there are different services in Google. So what prompted us to change is this new content that we're putting in place can distinguish between all the Google services. So I can block Google Plus going forward regardless of what account they use, so we can tighten up on those types of things. There's always going to be some new thing that'll be introduced that'll get around whatever protections we put in place. And we need to stay aware of those and be flexible enough to react to them. So that's just one example I wanted to share with you. Um, and that's a good reason why we decided to switch. The other thing, like I said on the slide here, is parental supervision is important. Stay engaged and stay involved with your kids. Um, because no matter how many controls and barriers I can put in their way, my job is also to give them resources and give them tools. And every time I have to block something, I'm taking something away. I don't like to do that, but I do that when it's important to do that. So I want to talk a little bit about the Casper uh, mobile management device suite that we have. As I mentioned, it does a variety of things. Let me push out software. And I want to really clarify what I said about software. The district has to own the software or own the subscription for me to distribute it. So it's not a matter of you buying a piece of software you want for your son or you buy something you want for your daughter. If the district owns a piece of software that we want to distribute to all students, we'll put it in the base image that's on the laptop to begin with. But if there's a specific course that your son or daughter is enrolled in, 
such as a web design course requires Adobe, Adobe Photoshop. There's a way for me to give them that on their student laptop, either pushing it out remotely to their device, knowing that they're enrolled in the course, or I can have them go to a self-service website and give them a special key when they're in that course to get the software. The nice thing about that, I can honor all the vendor license agreement information that way. So if we're ever audited, we can prove what we own. When the student is done with that course, the software is then removed. And that's all through the Casper suite. The nice thing from a student's perspective, and this really goes into the whole design of the one-to-one -one of a new high school, this allows us to eliminate the traditional computer lab model where you used to have to go to technology to use it, get to go to a specific location because this lab had 25 machines with Photoshop installed on it, and that's where I do my design work. Now it's on the student's laptop. Now the students can use this anywhere they go, at home, at school. Teachers can now give assignments to utilize these programs. And that's a huge benefit for our students. The other nice thing, it saves us money. We don't have to buy another lab of 25 machines and replace them in five years. So we're really trying to utilize the student laptops anywhere we possibly can through the curriculum. But the only way I can do that is I need a tool like the Casper Suite to let me do that. So that's what I want to make sure you take away from that. It's really a key thing that allows us to change the way we deliver software. The Casper Suite also allows us to do remote monitoring. And what we found is we used another remote monitoring package this year at the eighth grade level that was very problematic because it was too chatty on the network. The Casper Suite allows us to do that if we need to, if their students are not staying on task and uh, they're being disruptive. The administration has the ability to pull up their screen and see what they're doing in real time if they have to. So and you should just be aware of that. Some parents ask me, can we let you guys do that at home too? <laughs> the answer is no, sorry. Um, and inventory control tracks everything that we have and it's, it's extremely intelligent. So when we start getting into a more mobile environment like we are today, these types of things are not uh, nice to haves or must haves. Also at the high school and the middle schools, we have charging carts located strategically throughout the buildings. So this allows students, uh, say that they're at lunchtime, they're running low on their, um, on their uh, battery power, they can charge up within the buildings, we can also secure them. Uh, this one holds about 30 laptops that can charge them at the same time. So here's a quick summary of many of the things I just talked about regarding student safety that we built into the program. So no students have administrative rights to their laptop. We have a roaming internet filter in place that works at home and in school. Uh, email that we provide is archived for a period of one year. We provide antivirus software that's updated regularly. We provide an external backup drive to protect their data. And we use the uh, Casper uh, mobile management suite to manage all the devices on the, in the infrastructure. So from a technical support perspective, I shift gears and talk about this for a little bit. Um, my staff is district-wide. is district -wide. We're currently based at the current high school here, and we'll be based at the new high school. For the uh, middle schools, I have a certified technician at both my two middle schools. And it's really important as we implement the one-to-one -one initiative that we have people in the buildings ready to respond. Because if your son and daughters have issues, we need to provide immediate support. Next day support doesn't work in a one-to-one -one moment. It has to be now. So what we've done in the two middle schools as well as the high school, we have a stock of spare laptops. So that if a laptop is broken and we know it's going to take a while to fix, we have a loaner we can provide them. Also, I have certified techs that went and got training at Apple, so we can do warranty repairs on site. And actually, Apple pays us to do the warranty labor. So it gives us a credit in our account, which is really phenomenal, and a potential revenue generator. I don't want to generate a lot of revenue there because that means I'm doing a lot of repair work. But the, the good news is uh, we can do a lot of that work on site with our own staff, which is great. Um, so we're located at the high school on the second floor. I have a help desk manager and two technicians based at the high school, the two middle schools I have a tech apiece. And if anyone's ever really running into trouble, we have district-wide resources on my team to dispatch the buildings as we need to. Um, the process, and if you hear from the middle school principals, has worked very well at the two uh, middle schools regarding the eighth grade one-to-one. -one. Um, so I feel very confident in our model going forward with the high school. 
keeping in mind we have about 400 eighth graders in the program over the course of two middle schools and at the high school we have between 13 and 1400 which is obviously a few orders of magnitude uh, from that but I feel very confident about that we're available for tech support during the day from 7:30 to 3 we encourage both faculty and staff and students to stop by and see us if they have issues um, and which is really important because if you're having issues they only usually get worse if you delay recording those so the obvious question is, what do you do after hours? Um, I mentioned earlier we bundle in the AppleCare warranty. Um, AppleCare does a couple of things. It protects us against manufacturer defects and also gives us the ability um, to do uh, replacements and things. But the other thing is they give us an 800 number to call. So if it's outside of the regular school day and your son and daughter's working on it, say the hard drive dies, you have a couple options. Located lo locally in Annex and Apple Store, you can go there directly. They will honor the Apple Care warranty we have, and they can replace the part if necessary. You can call the 800 number if you have questions. But in, in addition to basic hardware support, they also offer advice about uh, application usage as well. So it's a good general number to call if you have. It's really just basic questions or you have hardware issues. You can feel free to call them. Um, and like I said, we have a local store right here in Natick, so. It's really convenient. So here's a little bit more details about the annual fee. To participate fully in the program, there is an annual $75 fee. And the thing I want to mention about this, this helps pay for us stocking extra parts. Um, this helps pay for the maintenance on the laptops over the course of their life. This will help us pay to replace the batteries in them after three years, right? Um, so a couple things, this protects us against manufacturer defects. Um, this year we also are offering an online payment option. You notice we didn't collect any money when you walked in the door. Last year we did this for the middle schools, we collected checks all right up front. So your principals will be sending you an email uh, when our online payment option is fully activated, which will be rather soon. You'll have up until August 15th to do this online without having to fill out any paperwork. By completing the transaction, you can get a copy of all of our policies, which you would agree to by completing the transaction. Um, we'll go through all the details. I strongly encourage, at the end of this presentation, we'll have links to both our student handbook as well as some of these policies. Really reinforcing these concepts at home with your sons and daughters is really critical to the success of this program. Every other place we went to, um, instilling all the accountability and just the, the general care of the devices was really most important to the success of the program. Um, we've stocked spares, but if we have a lot of breakage, that would be a problem. To give you some feedback at this point, we've had 15 incidences over the course of this year between the two middle schools. And the majority of those issues were liquid damage, Someone mixing food and computers doesn't work very well. And the other one is dropping them and cracking the screen. So probably two thirds of those were drops where screens got cracked. And the other were liquid damage. And really those are both preventable types of things. So if you reinforce those things, that they're careful with the device to avoid a drop, always carry it in its case, and don't mix food and the computer, that goes a long way to helping us there. Um, a couple other things regarding the $75, what it does not include. It doesn't include if it's dropped, like I just mentioned. It doesn't include if it gets stolen. And um, it doesn't include if you basically don't follow the acceptable use policy that we put in place. You know, and, and, and you're negligent, you drop it, you do something else. So what we've done is we instituted a tiered approach to enforce the accountability. We do expect minor wear and tear, dings on the case and things like that. That's what the $75 will help us cover. But if the hard, if the uh, DVD drive is broken because someone stuck something in it, that's tier two, that's a $100 fee. The types of things I just talked about, the crack screen and the liquid damage is tier three, $200. And the most severe is if it's lost or stolen, it'd be the full value of the device, which is around $900. Now, that's a big pill to swallow, and one of the things we've done to help mitigate that is we have a GPS tracking device installed in every laptop. So if you file a police report and say it was stolen, we're going to try to help you recover that so that you wouldn't have to pay that fee. Uh, over the course of this year, we haven't had any stolen 
we had one lost. We activated the GPS track and we were able to locate it within a matter of minutes, still in the building, and we recovered it. No harm, no foul. So I hope we'll say the same thing a year from now. Um, but it's there and we know that it works. So I just want people to feel uh, reassured by that. So at this point in the presentation, I'm going to pass it on to Principal Bertucci to talk a little bit more about some of the high school aspects of the program. And then one of the middle school principals will also get up as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. I'm going over this with the, with the parents because we've already discussed this in the school with the students, so I figured we would be on the, on the same page. And basically the regulations are, as Dennis had already pointed out, uh, the worst damage that we've had so far we've seen at the middle schools is basically droppage or a spillage, with liquid spillage on the laptops. Um, we've also, you know, tried to say to the kids that when you carry your laptops, you're going to have to use um, a little sleeve that we are going to be giving to the students as well. We kind of changed the bag from the eighth grade model that we have now to a smaller bag. It looks more like a sleeve, but it's a padded sleeve that's going to help protect the laptop. And we're asking the students, when they're carrying their laptop, to carry it in the sleeve. The teachers are going to have to do the same thing. We're going to model that behavior, and we're hoping that that minimizes um, damage to the computer. Anything we can do to minimize the damage um, to the computer is important. Um, so the first, you know, this, these are the rules and regulations of the high school. The middle school will speak to them. They're very similar. Uh, they do it in a little bit of a different format. This is the way it'll go in our handbook. So uh, one of the things is carrying the laptop. Uh, we've also told the students that, remember, the laptops, even though they will be with you for four years, and it will be the same laptop that you receive every year back after the summer, after we re-image it every summer, you can't deface the computer. So you can't put uh, stickers on the computer and kind of make it your own because um, the problem is they still, they really don't belong to you. They belong to the native public schools. So we've asked the students not to do that. And some of the kids have thought about ideas of maybe getting their own cover and then being able to, you know, personalize the cover. That's fine as long as it doesn't damage or change the computer, the laptop as it was given to them. Eating and drinking, we've already discussed this. Um, you know, at the high school, we're going into a new high school, and so I was giving them the story of basically, you know, when you buy a brand new car, you don't want seven of your friends, you know, with McDonald's jumping in the back seat because you want to try and keep it as new as possible. Well, the same thing with the laptops. We want to maintain the laptops in the best in the best possible condition they can. So we're asking them uh, to not eat or not drink near the computer. That's been one of the one things that's happened is if you spill water on it, it's devastating to the laptop. So we've asked them not to do that. Going into the new school, um, you know, we're going to ask for no food in the classrooms anyway. And drinks, we're probably going to limit to a screw top bottle uh, that they can have. So they can walk around with bottled water um, as long as it has a screw top, and we'll ask them to put them aside as they go into the classrooms. Uh, at the middle school, it's the same thing. We want to make sure that we're not trying to, you know, trying to upkeep the school and the laptops at this point. The, violent, the acceptable use policy is probably, again, you know, as um, Dennis has already spoken, uh, kids try to circumvent the system at times. And we all know that the internet is a very powerful tool, positively and negatively. So we encourage the student to read the internet use policy. We expect them to abide by the rules and to not bully or get involved in activities um, that are inappropriate at any time. So the laptop distribution, again, we're going to be distributing laptops to about 1,300 students all at once. And we really wanted to hit the road running when we start school. So we picked a week in August, which is the last week in August, to try and distribute the laptops. And many, of, some of you have actually said, well, you might be on vacation. It really didn't matter what week we picked. I, you know, it would have interfered with someone. So we have set aside extra days if people can't make that week. But that week is when we really want the students to come and get their laptop in this type of um, 
manner. So on the Monday, it would be seniors, juniors, sophomores, freshmen. And at the time when we put this schedule together, uh, the football team wasn't going to be around. They were going to be going away. So we decided to make an extra day for them because it's about 125 students. And uh, now we have uh, realized that they're not going to be traveling. But since they are going to be going into double sessions, we decided to keep that day. We have to send all the names to the, to the company that's imaging the computer. So we decided to leave it that way. And so the days are that. If you can make it, great. If you can't, you should email me, and I will give you a time and date, uh, and a different time and date to come and pick up the laptop. We're trying to separate it. We're actually going to try and incorporate tours to the new school at the high school. Um, we probably won't be giving tours until the end or mid-August because even though the school will be uh, built, it's still not furnished. And so the furniture, it's going to be a very active summer as the furniture keeps coming in from different vendors. So it's going to be a very active place as we try to furnish and unpack. So we probably won't be ready until the third week in August. So we would like to, by last name, um, separate the students. They would basically come in and they would um, take a laptop. They'll come into, they'll be signed into by one of the administrative assistants. They'll sign them in and then they'll come into the auditorium. We will give them a brief description, um, some instructions, and then we'll take the groups into classrooms where they'll actually power up the laptop and then change their password. We'll make sure everything is up and running for the student to take it home and they can use it over the weekend and get used to it. Um, and again, if you have any questions, just ask me. At that point, after that, the laptop distribution will take the students around and tour them around the school so they can see what the school looks like. At this point, I'm going to give um, the mic over to the middle school principal. Let's see, Mrs. Vickery is going to come over from Kennedy to talk about the middle school laptop distribution so you get a sense of how that's going to go. Thank you. Thank you. And we did this last year, um, and it went, went fairly smoothly. We have no need of calling kids in the summer to pick up their laptops, but teachers have totally changed their teaching environment and their classroom pedagogy and they want to hit the ground running like all good teachers do. So we will distribute the laptops in the first week of school. Um, in the homeroom, we've got a tech ed, a tech guy, Mr. Tech Guy at our um, disposal. He helps us distribute that. Prior to that, we'll have an assembly with all the students laying out the rules and the regulations for them, which are also in our handbook. Um, the behavior code and the rubric at the middle schools is a little bit different than what Ms. Bertucci had just gone over, and we feel it's developmentally appropriate practice. We aren't using a Saturday detention model, if you will, because we don't have that right now, but we do have tiered um, levels of consequences for our students, and all of that is laid out for students immediately um, upon them getting the laptop. I have to say that we both did this, Ms. Nolan and myself did it this year with our students. We met with them in the assembly. We distributed the lap we met with them in the assembly. We made them bring their laptop with them to the assembly and we went through exactly how to carry them. And we probably looked a little foolish in that here's how to put it in the bag. Here's what you should not have in the bag when you put it in the bag because anything it's magnetized will um, damage the laptop. We really explicitly told the kids what they needed to do because that's what we needed to do with eighth graders. A little bit different probably at the high school, but I want to assure you that we lay out all the groundwork way before the kids actually start to use the laptop for instruction and learning. Logins and passwords. Students will have their logins. They can't change their passwords. Um, we tell them to use passwords that are easily remembered. They're going to have a number of passwords and logins for the different products that they'll be using, the iPass, the Moodle, Destiny, Google, and students should not share their password with anyone. That always sounds like I'm stating the obvious again, but students are friends and, oh, I don't mind if you use it, go right ahead. And two minutes later, there's a problem in the school. So we tell the kids not to share their um, passwords except with their parents. And Ms. Nolan and I tell all of our parents at the um, middle level that you have every right to ask for your child's passwords. And in fact, last year we passed out a piece of paper with boxes on it. So everything that they logged on to, you had the password to. So when they say you can't have it, you tell them that we said that you can. Because that's the only way you're going to be able to monitor what they're doing at our level. And we want to keep the kids safe. So that adult supervision is really important and we encourage that. 
um, data backup. Students are responsible for backing up their data. They're, um, as Mr. Roach had said, they're given an external drive. We've taught our kids that you should do it once a week. I do it every Sunday night. There's a note on my um, desktop, on my electronic desktop, that says back it up. So that if anything goes wrong, we're able to recapture their data, anything that's lost. Students, when they come into school, will now set up all of their Good news is no more binders. All of their binders online in folders, just as you do for your work, I'm sure. Teachers are teaching the kids how to set up the organizational structure that they'll need for learning. Um, anything goes wrong, we're able to retrieve most of that or all of that information if they've backed up their machine. Um, our tech department has also put out some wonderful videos that we'll more, more than likely share with our students. Um, because they really explicitly tell them what they need to do in order to back up their machine. The laptops are collected at the middle level at the end of the school year, re-imaged, and then our laptops stay at the middle level. So the eighth graders' current laptops, they'll stay at the middle school, and this year's seventh graders will get them as eighth graders. That's why we, too, discourage any de um, defacing. You can't put stickers on it. You have to carry it along, carry it around in a... Um, bag, and we've really had very little problem with that, which is really good news. The kids, the interesting thing with this whole project is that the kids, this is their lifeline. They don't want to damage it if they can help it, because they really live and die by the use of this laptop, both at home and at school. So there's that um, vested interest to play by the rules, which doesn't always work in middle schools, so that's nice to know as well. Um, Laptop Cure, again, this is like stating the obvious. You can read this slide, but this is exactly the explicit instruction that we give to our kids, that they have to be carried, they have to be charged nightly. We encourage our kids to keep their um, charger at home. We have chargers in school if the charge goes down, so at least the charger doesn't get lost. I'm not sure if the high school is going to be doing the same thing, but we'll have ability in the buildings to recharge if necessary in those carts that Mr. Roach had shown earlier. You're not going to walk around with your laptop open. I have to say that the people that we most have to work with are our teachers and our administrators because we're not very good followers of rules ourselves. But we're starting to model for students. We put our laptops in our bags and walk around the school like that. Um, avoid eating and drinking. Again, all the things that we had just talked about. Um, one of the interesting things that we talked to kids about was that we taught them that when you have your laptop plugged in, and again, this sounds foolish, but all of a sudden your little brother is next to you in bed and you go to move him or something, you've now pulled the cord, you've got a problem. So be very, very careful where you're using the laptops. We're saying to kids, use them on a hard surface and your lap is in a hard surface. What happens in your homes is up to you, but that's what we're telling kids in schools to make sure that they're on a hard, stable surface for use. Oh, again, don't leave anything on your keyboard when closing it. Don't use your laptop to put folding papers. Um, keep it in your carrying case. And we've also tested our middle school bag so that it's water repellent. Um, it's, a bit, it's a bit larger than a sleeve, so kids can fit a couple of notebooks and pens in there. Um, and it also is a, a kind of a bike carrying bag. You can walk, be put across your body. So we have a number of bikers that um, students who bike to school so that they're able to bike with their laptop on them. And that came as a result of one of our parent forums um, who said, you know, my child bikes to school and my child also has to carry an instrument. How are they going to manage? And we really tried to accommodate all those different needs. Taking care of your laptop, don't leave it in the car. This is probably more appropriate for high school students, but in the freezing cold weather, you're going to damage your laptop if you leave it in the car overnight. Same, similarly in the summer, don't leave it in the car when it's hot. At middle school, we don't have to worry about the car routine so much, but be very careful where you leave your laptop overnight. Again, we're encouraging our middle school parents to have students work with the laptops in a common family area so you can monitor what's going on. And also you, to t say to the kids, leave your laptop down here. It's not going to go into your bedroom. When you're going into your bedroom, you're going to bed. Now, that's how it didn't always work successfully in my family, but then I knew what my kids were doing. And I knew that they weren't going to open their laptop at 4 o'clock in the morning just to ch start chatting with their friends. So you certainly have the right to ask your kids to leave the laptop downstairs with you. Hard drives shouldn't be bouncing around. Um, the hard drive in the machine itself can get damaged. Again, this is an explicit instruction that we do with the kids. I feel foolish saying it to an adult audience because I know that you all know this, but I want to reassure you the instruction that we give the students is very, very explicit as to the care of the laptops. 
we went over most of this. The power adapter to the laptop, it, of course, doesn't stretch. It's not a stretchable extension, so you have to be careful how you plug it in and where you're using it. Don't insert things that are metal. When you're opening the laptop, as Mr. Rocha talked about earlier, he can push out software to the students. And sometimes when they open their laptop again, it's not immediately there for them. They start pushing the keys like this. It's not going to make, the ha make it happen any sooner, but it can damage the keys. So we've asked the kids to be very mindful of that. If the students have problems with their laptop, we ask them to ask the teacher for assistance. We also said to students that if you inadvertently go to the wrong website and you think you're going to get in trouble, just put your hand up and say, I just need some help over here. So that, again, our students at eighth grade have taken this pretty seriously. We've had very little trouble with this kind of thing. I just said to Ms. Um, Nolan on an anecdotal level here, um, my favorite diversion when I'm writing reports for the State Department of Education is go on to Casper Remote and see what the eighth graders are up to. And I just take my, my <laughs> it's a little bit twisted principal humor, but anyway. Um, that, and I have to tell you that I've been pleased with what I've found. Yes, there have been one or two, but there are not 200 kids doing the wrong thing. So I'm very pleased with our results thus far. The laptops can't be cleaned with any liquids unless we tell you which ones to use and we teach our kids how to do that. Again, obvious. Um, they're not marking the laptops with stickers or anything like that. Each laptop comes with an asset tag underneath. It's a uh, Native Public Schools asset tag, and that asset tag number is um, correlated to your child's name. When your child gets the laptop, it's a white laptop, and off to the side is a barcode with that asset tag number and the child's name on it. And it, there's also a meta, metal tag underneath the laptop, so we're able to track um, the inventory as well as tracking in case of problems, as um, Mr. Roach had talked about with the GPS system. Charging the laptop is really important and we tell that to students. We've not had too much trouble with laptops running down their charge during the school day, but when that has happened, if students are going off to lunch, we'll say, go up to Mr. Westlake's office, that's our tech guy, and he will charge it for you or leave it in your homeroom class room and you can leave it in the charging cart and then pick it up before you go to your next class. There have been few and few instances of that, I have to be honest with you. The kids come fully prepared for class with them fully charged. And again, the first couple of times that the kids came in without it charged, if it happened to them, they realized that they probably hadn't plugged the plug in properly and they thought they were charging it, but they hadn't. So they learned as they went on how to do things correctly. Be wary of theft, stayed in the obvious. Mr. Um, Roach talked about how we can track it through the GPS if that's a problem. So far, we haven't had any stolen, knock on wood. Been really happy about that. Um, we tell students at the middle level, for after school activities, they actually leave their laptop at Kennedy, and I know Ms. Nolan has made arrangements at Wilson as well. Students who are going out on sporting events can either, their parents can either pick them up at dismissal and they go home. And if that can happen, we've got a place where we lock them until the students come back. I'll try my teacher voice. Back off the bus. We have them locked up so they can. Okay, that's better. Um, they're locked up while the kids are off at the game. They pick them up and they don't, you don't have to worry about them being on a field with the laptop in a case and somebody walking away and leaving it. At the high school, my understanding is, is that all the lockers will have locks and the students can leave them locked in their locker, or again, if they want to get them home before any events happen. Internet safety training in school. We do exhaustive training about how to handle the laptop. As we said, we also talk about the safety issues for the laptop. Um, internet safety is paramount. Kids can go places that we wouldn't want them to go. Again, that's adult supervision that will help us with that and educate the child about how to use it. Um, that's all I'll say about that. I'm sure that you have already told this to your children at home, but we reiterate it often in school that students need to be very mindful of their personal information and to whom they give it. They're not to give out any information about themselves. 
Some students will have iTunes accounts where they'll want to download some music and that will be okay and they're going to use a credit card and be careful you don't leave your bags open at home because they might want to be using your credit card. Um, and the, that music at some point in time, I should just say, they'll have to download to a thumb drive prior to turning in their laptop because you've paid for that and the kids are going to want to um, have that available to them. They can do that at the end of the year. Never arrange face-to-face -face meetings, never share. Um, personal information, we tell kids not to um, open emails if you don't know who it's from. This is a network environment that they work in. Anything that they open up can open up viruses, so if you don't know who sent it to you, don't open it and report it. We ask them not to click on banners or ads or pop-ups, and a lot of our software already takes care of that, but as soon as we take care of it, the next day somebody is able to create something that will then override that. So we also tell the kids about the use of bad language or in threatening email, that they get to places that they don't, they get themselves in trouble that they don't really know about. And we stress the laws about cyberbullying. It's part of our character education programs at both middle schools and again at the high school. So we really tell the kids that they, it's up to them to keep themselves safe and we give them the instructions that will help them to do that. Home internet use, as I just said, we. Do, we encourage you to have it in a common room. We also encourage you to limit the time that the students are on electronic devices. I raised four kids, three of them that are techies, and it's not an easy task to have them turn off, but it is for their own safety, and I would encourage you to do that. We also talk to the kids, I should just say, about safety physical safety, the ergonomics of that, how to use a laptop appropriately, because from this point on in their lives, they're gonna be using them, as you all know. So we want the kids to be physically saved, and in our manual, we do go into the ergonomics about how to um, use a laptop properly, so you're not gonna have things like repetitive stress injuries. We talked about parents getting the student's password. We talked about um, you having access to your student's email. Threatening email can't be sent, spam and junk mail don't reply. Attachments bring the danger of viruses. And it, kids think they know everything about that, but it's still worth having the conversation with them. So I would suggest as a parent-to-parent -parent kind of conversation, when the laptop arrives in your home, you initiate the conversation like, tell me what you've learned about how to use that safely. Here's what I'm gonna do about the rules here. And then you move on from there. That's how we found it to be most successful in the eighth grade. Laid out the expectations for behavior and performance to the students, and then laid out consequences if there was any um, misbehavior. And I won't tell you that it's been smooth sailing, but I've been pleasantly surprised by how successful we've been at the eighth grade level with this. The resources available for you as parents to learn about this project more. We did a lot of research, as Dr. Sanchioni had said, and it's all online at these websites. These slides will be put online as well, so if you didn't catch the letters for your high school distribution, you'll be able to have that available to you. They'll be on the Native Public School website. And I think that pretty much wraps it up for us. We're happy to stay and take any questions that you may have. and. Um, that's about it. Thank you for being here this evening. Hi, I'm Anna Nolan, the principal at Wilson. I just wanted to let you know that there's a new parent network that is starting in Natick. It's run by Kennedy, Princip uh, Kennedy parent um, Catherine Green, who happens to also work at Wilson. And one of the reasons for the emergence of this group is that certainly with new technology that becomes available for our students, new challenges come for parents. So some of you are tech savvy, and the conversations that we're having tonight don't scare you at all, but some of you are not as tech savvy, or you're worried about what the new challenges may be with this technology in your students' hands. And this network, which will also be posted on the um, Digital Conversion website and the Parent One-to-One -one Resources um, website, will be a group that you can get together with to discuss certain things around this new technology. So I always give the example, um, you know, if you're getting together to talk with um, your your kids' friends group and their parents about, you know, what happens if you see my child out there in the world doing 
uh, you know, drinking alcohol or at a party unsupervised. We always tell parents it's a good idea to get together with your friend group's um, parents and have conversations about how you're going to set limits as a group in that way so that you have some common agreements. So I don't show up at your house, you know, and there's some wacky thing happening and you didn't do anything about it and vice versa. Computer use is no different. Limit setting, it just like cell phones and texting and all of that does require some parenting around that. And if you would like to get some advice from other parents who have been through the laptop program or as you become a community that is becoming accustomed to this, this group could serve that purpose. So there'll be information on that and you can reach out to uh, Catherine Green for more information about that network. You can also reach out to any one of us, but specifically sometimes you just want to call up another parent and kind of have a have a heart to heart. So that resource is available. Okay, at this point, we'll open up for questions and answers, and we only have one mic, so if you raise your hand, I'll walk around and give you the mic so everyone can hear your question. I'll start right here in the middle. My question is about printers at home. Will my daughter have access to print something from home? Uh, yes, um, printers at home are allowed. Uh, we recommend you use a local USB-connected printer. Try not to print wirelessly. Every home network is different and unique. Um, so to eliminate issues, uh, do it USB. Uh, the issue we've run into this year is sometimes if it's an older printer or a very new printer, the print driver may not be installed on the, the laptop. If that's the case, if your son and daughter comes into school, tells us to make a model of your printer, we can download the drivers for them and put it on. Uh, the Apple operating system has hundreds if not thousands of print drivers on there but the odds are if you have a very old or very new printer it may not be there you need to be installed by one of our technicians so that's what we, how we deal with that you can try you can try to get it to work wirelessly i just don't know every home network could be set up differently your best experience if you plug in usb and it will discover it automatically if the driver's there okay if you do have any issues looking up a printer, let us know and we will assist you with that. I'll take a question back here. How do they save their work from year to year? It's all on the computer. Are they, are they our, our policy has always how been that. Could you repeat the question? Yeah, how do students save their work every year? From year to year. From year to year. Our policy is usually to clear out things every year so they start clean. Uh, but what the principals have just uh, indicated, uh, they'll be doing backups at the end of the year. We do provide backup drives during the school year, but since we're collecting all that equipment, um, if they want to save their data, they can either post things to Google Docs, which they'll have all the time. So that's one way to do it. It doesn't cost you to have to buy anything to do that. Um, but if you want to buy additional storage, if they have a lot of stuff, that's obviously an option you have available to you, too. At the eighth grade level, we'll be keeping the backup drives and all that hardware at the eighth grade level. At the high school level, students will have the equipment the whole life in the high school. So we're looking at next year, maybe allowing them to keep those drives over a period of time, since they'll have them for the full four years in high school. Okay. Uh, I'll take a question in the back. This is really more about the educational use of the device. So are there no longer going to be any books that are used in the schools? Is everything going to be online books and online um, testing? And then my second question is, what if your child already owns a Mac lab? How do you deal with people that already own their own? Are you forced to do this, or is there an, uh, uh, an out? I'll take the second question first. Um, for consistency's sake, you need to use the school laptop because you're going to have all the school software on it. So the, the way the program was designed, all the teachers and students have exactly the same build, which will minimize surprises, and that's why we're providing everyone the same devices. So you can't have that, that, that software downloaded onto your uh, No, for licensing reasons, I need to be able to account for that. The only way I can do that is on school issued devices. So that's, that's the reason for that. So the second question, And Sandy, just to reassure you and let you know, um, we traveled across the country to find out what do schools do, who do this. And a lot of the people who had bring your own devices issues, instructional flow was often disrupted by the fact that we 
the school side could not manage the device totally. So students and families would do things to the computer and over the weekend, say, come in on a Monday, it would completely shut down and co-opt that child's education that day. Um, so in this way, every single child without regard to their wealth status or their accessibility status have access to the same tools. Uh, so it's, it's an excellent equalizer and gives us all a level playing field to start oh, on. No, I completely, so I yep. can understand yep. that and support that. And just, so I it have a device to keep track of in mind. Right, <laughs> right, right. Good news, Sandy, <laughs> you'll have time on your computer. <laughs> That's a great news. Um, the other part of, it, of your question about instruction is the, the short answer is no, not everything will be online. And one of the things that I want to just reassure people about is there is no substitute for the interaction and learning that happens between a teacher and children. And the Natick Public Schools remains very committed to that model. What we have found, though, is that laptop use strikes further into the heart of engagement and rigor in ways that we have not seen um, in prior implementations. You know, it looks different than prior education. So it's going to take some getting used to, mostly for us, because we haven't had that experience. Um, that said, um, there'll be a balance of interpersonal interactions, that's still a part of school, social time. Um, many times we're in classrooms and the teachers will say, laptops at 45 degrees, we're gonna discuss this and we're gonna do this and we're gonna move around the room. So I don't wanna um, paint the picture that everyone's gonna be at their little cubicles, you know, typing away the whole day. School is still a social activity where people interact around content. We now have been able to extend that learning environment through the use of technology as well. Um, in terms of text Books, that market is changing daily, um, so there will be a mix of online resources and in and good old-fashioned book resources, just as there is now in many of the locations at the high school and at the middle schools. So my question is about the GPS and the success of the GPS. What kind of technology are you using? Are you using LoJack, or is it another kind of technology? Is it hardware, is it software? And also, my second question. So, um, if my son loses the computer, am I able to try to track that computer myself using my own computer, or is it something that you have to do? Um, <clears throat> regarding the GPS tracking, uh, I don't talk much about whether it's software or hardware. For obvious reasons, students will try to find ways around it. <laughs> so I'm not going to say anything specific about it. Um, and it's really for school district use when something's reported lost or stolen and a police report is filed. Right? It's not for us tracking our students where they are right this second with the device. Okay. No, it's, it's, it's not for that purpose, right? I'll go over this side. So the question was, what's the standard software we have on it? Because you have someone who uses a Mac at home. Uh, I covered that in an earlier slide. So it's the whole iLife suite. Um, we have open office. Um, we use uh, Google Apps for Education, which is an online web-based resource. We also use Moodle, which is a web-based resource. And there's other specific software based on what classes your student, son or daughter, takes which will differ. So if they take, like I said, I used the example of a web design class. There's a video editing classes. So other teachers will incorporate other things and ask us to publish it on our self-service website. But the Casper suite only works on devices that we own that are registered with Casper. That's another reason why we don't embrace the home device model too. So we need to really be careful about how we distribute software. It's software the district owns and can distribute it. What about access to like WeChat or being able to get to their friends? Like one of the things that night we were 
So the questions regarding regarding chatting, uh, give you a couple. Uh, chatting is not a, an acceptable use unless there's a, a specific educational re reason that a teacher implements it. As an example, our teachers have Skype, but our students don't. So if there's a Skype session, which is just a way to video conference, our teachers will direct and guide that. Within the Google environment, we've turned off Google Chat for students but students know Google's also a collaborative environment, so they could open up and start a document, and their friend could start collaborating in a document, and that could be considered a chat session. So those things are inherent to Google, and parents need to be aware of that, because that's another parental type of thing you should be well aware of. But we do not necessarily give, we don't give them high chat, we don't give them all these other things that are out there. Um, in fact, we put a lot of protections in place with the content filter to try to lock down a lot of these things. But new ones get introduced every day. So these are the things to keep your eyes peeled on. Like the Google Plus thing I mentioned earlier on was another new one that came out this year. And it's not even supposed to be used by students under the age of eight, 18. So um, these are things to be aware of. I'll take a question. Yeah. One thing in terms of the collaborative platform though, students can still collaborate authentically and in real time through Google Documents. So we see students doing that all the time. So you know that, that experience you're stating is exactly the experience that can continue to happen. What do we do in cases where there is no home access to the internet? If it's not available or it's not on? That's a good question. It's part of a solution, and we're looking at multiple options, but one of the things we're going to do is that wonderful facility we're opening on West Street, we're going to keep the library open Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday evening, 7 to 9. And actually, if you park within 300 yards of the high school, you'll pick up the internet. <laughs> I didn't say that. <laughs> if you sit at Panera, you can get Wilson's, too. Uh, just kidding, you can't. Um, Comcast is running specials um, for students who might have financial hardship and families who might have financial hardship. And all of that information has gone home at the beginning of the year, um, this past year. So, I mean, in some cases I've read that um, families were able to get free access if they worked with Comcast. So, you know, I haven't checked that out myself, but we handed out the literature to that effect. Question right here. Could you just explain <clears throat> in a little more detail the boundaries between what's acceptable use versus personal use versus school use? Because when I was first listening to you, it occurred that probably these things are only designed for school and classwork related um, usage. But then you mentioned, well, they could bring in iTunes. And then I started thinking, well, is it acceptable or unacceptable use to use the software that you've given them to do personal things with the software? I mean, obviously they could do it. You might be able to find out or you might not, but is that part of the policy? Is the policy to basically say, hey, if you're gonna be using computers for personal use, use a family computer or another computer in the house. We just want these for school. Um, well, the answer is a little complicated. We model the separation of personal and school. Um, it's hard to separate, separate out an iTunes account because of its application you know, potential from the music. And one of the pieces of research that we did when we went across the country found that students took better care of the laptop and were more invested in its care if they were allowed to put music on it. So also, 
There are many multimedia projects for which music is required, but know this, we're not telling them to go buy stuff with your credit card using the iTunes stuff. We're not, we're never gonna say that. So you're gonna be 100% in charge of that. So personalizing it with their music, but we have been very clear that they may not put explicit music on it and anything that would violate school use, it's just like their locker. They have it, but it's not theirs. So at any time, we could be in it or on it or around it or viewing it. I mean, Ro told you about our secret guilty pleasure of watching students' laptops from our um, <laughs> office. And it's all very G-rated uh, so far, anyway. Um, but there's the real expectation that it is for work pieces. And any time we have seen other things, like, say, commerce or something like that, we have called students on that. Uh, so just to follow up that, as an example, I wouldn't have your sons and daughters just download the whole iTunes library as an example. I'd be very selective in how you decide to do that. Okay, another question. Uh, with that, with the students downloading iTunes, do, does this filtering software that you have installed uh, keep them from ordering uh, songs with explicit lyrics or anything like that? Uh, no, it, it, it doesn't get to that level of granularity. At least I haven't seen that yet in any of the filters. Other questions? Um, while this is all so exciting um, for the students, I also am sensing, at least from uh, one student I've spoken with just a couple hours ago, that um, there's some anxiety associated with it too, and I think that's regarding you know, having something valuable that you're responsible for um, and having all of these rules in place, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this, and so I'm just curious um, how you're dealing with that, with the kids. I mean, we had a mid-year meeting with our students to ask them, so how's it going? You know, what are we missing? What should we do? And um, aside from complaining about the filter and how we should have freedom of speech, be able to do whatever, <laughs> you know? Aside from that, um, which I believe in, but you know there are some limits. There was an initial trepidation on the part of students about, eesh, you know, what? Wow, we're getting this thing. Um, but by mid-year in January, when we met with them, they said that they were never going to let us down with this initiative. That they felt so amazing, they they couldn't believe we trusted them with this tool. And this is what we heard when we visited Maine and North Carolina too. They, they just felt like my school system is doing this and none of the other school systems around us are doing this in quite the same way. Um, and they, they just said like, we, we're never gonna let you down about it. And it's been a real empowering piece for them. And anytime we've come up with issues, students have advised us around how we might handle that. So we've tried to really partner with them and I think that's kind of taken the anxiety out of the situation because let's face it, they're great thinkers around use of these tools. And while we've done a lot of advanced thinking, they've worked out a lot of kinks for us too. So the, the success of opening the new Natick High School is really about what the kids have shown us is possible. So I think that that took down the anxiety. The first week, everyone was like, ah, but then, and that's just me I'm speaking about, I was like freaking out too. Um, but they were just, they've just done so beautifully with it. I, I couldn't be like a proud mom any more than I am about our kids. Other questions are right up here. I, I could just um, My ninth grader uses Skype all the time to do physics homework. And they're bringing up images or shorts and stuff on the, you know, on the camera to get homework. So you said that Skype is not an application that is important. Yeah, it's not an application we've given students at this point. That is correct. Um, so if that's something that's actually being used, then we probably need to talk about that. Yeah. But I, I would say at least one of the And the other concern that my student has brought to me, based on rumors, is that the school can remotely activate the cameras. The, the camera. Is there a camera? Is there a camera? Yeah, so the question was, can the school district remotely activate the webcam? Because all these laptops, and I think typically laptops you buy nowadays, have a built-in webcam. The only software we have as a school district that can activate the webcam is the GPS tracking software. So if it is stolen, I can get a picture of who's using it while it's stolen. And that's the only time we will activate that. And I only do that if you file a police report. Otherwise, we won't even go there. 
Who control webcam active otherwise? Can they do it? Well, if you have applications like Skype that activates the webcam to display your picture, which we do not give the students for that very reason. So we don't equip software to activate the cam to do those types of things. But there's other applications like Photo Booth, which is a local application on the laptop where they can take their own photos. But again, this all goes back to acceptable use and what we expect the students to be able to do. So we want to make sure that everyone understands what's in the handbook for acceptable use. And if we reinforce in school and then reinforce at home, that's really what we're looking for. All right, question way up in the back. Um, so I'm just curious about the, um, this help desk. Uh, I'll conceptually call it so there's one person and two helpers at the high school. So if how do you prioritize requests that come into this help desk? Because you're not even when you said you know quantum you've gone from 400 eighth graders to 1300 high schools, but you also have admin folks as well as all the, t the teaching staff. So. Is there some like triaging system for how do you access, um, how do you prioritize requests that come in? Like my son at the high school has never gone to his locker. And I have talked to countless of his friends, none of them have gone to their locker. The locker, I can't even imagine what the size of the new high school, I'd be very curious the percentage of kids that use their locker, but when you're being told that that may be the place that they would lock it up for sporting events afterwards, it would seem, that seems a little bit absurd. But um, prioritizing the request, and do you have remote access, or do the kids, if they're having a problem and they're on like one wing of the building at the furthest north, do they have to physically go to this room? Like at, at Children's, where I work, people, you have by that little um, digital ID number, they can remotely access wherever we are when we call in on the help desk, and it avoids the geographic challenge. Uh, we, we deploy all those types of solutions, so we do have the ability to remote into students if they call for support or contact So they support. don't have to physically go to this No, as long as we know who it is. We do that with faculty all the time now. So, like I said, my staff is based out of the high school, but we have different responsibilities. We, we offer remote support regularly. Um, we also have a centralized ticketing system which um, the faculty can email us directly, and so can the students. So that's one way they can communicate with us. It gets right into the ticketing system, and then we could remote in knowing that what the issue is. There's all kinds of ways. And you we know have. where you're at in the queue? Uh, we don't necessarily do get to that level of granularity because we never know what a given day is going to bring. But we certainly have a way to track everything that comes in. There's a manager that's responsible for that. We always have someone available to answer the phone in that help desk area that's district-wide. Um, and it's, again, it's a method we've had in place for seven years. So we've done this for a long time for the whole district. So we currently provide sports to all the students today, but we get those additional devices. Obviously, that's another challenge we're going to have. Uh, but I feel very confident in the staff and procedures we have to handle those types of things. And then is there a discussion that there's another option for a lockup after school versus going to this locker that could be who knows where? All right, question on the locker. Do you have any sense of those, how many kids actually use their lockers? No, we don't. We provide a locker. It's up to the students to use it. Some need it, some don't. Some like to carry their books around with them, and some don't. So we give them a locker. It's up to them whether they want to use it or not. These lockers at the new school, the reason we've talked about the lockers and being able to store them is that we also have 244 cameras in the school. And the hallways are monitored by cameras. So if you feel that you want to leave your laptop somewhere safe, that is one option. We're looking at other options, possibly putting something in the library, which is centrally located in the high school, for athletes to maybe come and lock their laptops during, you know, and since the, the um, high school library will be open extended hours, they could leave it there and come back. Some students will leave it in their cars because, you know, I mean, if you leave a laptop in a car for an hour, it's not a bad thing if it's not really, really warm or really, really cold. Um, but again, that's up to the students. They'll feel their way around where they feel more secure.
secure to put their laptop, and we will look at different things as we get into the new building. But right now, we, you know, again, what I would say right away is that the locker is available, and it's a very secure place because there are cameras all over the school. So if you want to leave your, you know, laptop somewhere, that is one option that we have for sure right now. Question up the top? Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering who monitors the monitors. Uh, uh, you just, you know, you can start the cameras, you can get into mm -hmm. the email, you give them tools that they can share things. I assume that they will send email to each other. I heard the principal, it's a joke, I understand, but the principal actually looks at what the kids are doing. Who monitors the monitors? Where Who monitors the monitors? Who monitors the monitors? Who guarantees the, the students' privacy? How do we guarantee that this yeah, information that you can go and look at does not seep out and yeah. used against the students? So, so basically the question is what accountability do we have for all these monitoring tools? Is that right. That right. right. Auditing right. tools yep. for uh, the auditing. So uh, as an example, the Casper management suite that lets me see student screens in real time has an audit log. So I can see who's pulled up a student screen, who's done what, what students did they pull up. So people aren't just doing that for fun, yeah. right? There's, a, there's, a, there's an audit trail that's created. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is all these automated tools are very limited in who can do that. We don't allow classroom teachers to do that. It'll just be the middle school or high school administrative staff that can do that, or my team, all right? So even within my group, I limit who has access to these automated tools so that it's not everyone in my team, but just the people that I trust will use them appropriately, okay? So we really limit access, and that's the key thing, and this accountability. So if someone's doing something they shouldn't be doing, they won't be doing that anymore, okay? So how secure is all of this information? How secure are your passwords? How many people exactly have access to GPS information on these kids and where they are every day? Well, that's a very small group. Uh, yeah. Thanks, I want to lay these concerns here because this is a tool for learning and it's not about violating anyone's First Amendment rights or going places where you think we may for no apparent reason. We have to have... It's not just you, it's somebody else getting access to the tool right. you have. There's not... We there's, trust you guys. Thank you. Somebody else getting access. It, it would be impossible because it's our servers and it's our routers and it's the things that control the system. The only Dennis and his staff, our principals and myself have access to this. It's just... Mm -hmm. There's no possible way anyone can invade that. And well, I won't say possible, I guess there's always thing possible, but it's not designed for that. And again, we're not gonna be looking at people's computers for no probable cause. You know, the, you, you need, if there's a reason we feel like a student is violating our acceptable use policy, then we reserve the right to look at their computer. What sort of training are you planning for the students and teaching limits uh, similar to what we're going on in middle school? Yeah. At the middle level, we've had um, classes since fifth grade for, for the students. For the high school coming up next year is what I'm asking about. Rose, I'm sorry, I missed the question. I was saying the, the question was what sort of training and sharing these limits with the students are going to go on in high school so they learn the rules? I'll, I'll start and hand it to Rose, but the current freshman class went through the course when they were in eighth grade. The incoming ninth grade went through the course when they're currently as eighth graders. So half the school has gone through extensive training when they're in middle school. The juniors and seniors. But well, we've had courses, you know, like internet management, um, internet security that some of the students have taken. Um, but we also, you know, again, when we introduce, in, when we want the teach, when the teachers want the students to, to uh, use the internet, they always go through a little bit of, you know, being careful. Now, by the time you're a junior and senior, they're pretty well versed on, you know, basic where to goes and where not to goes. And we also encourage them that if they happen to hit a site that's inappropriate, that's gotten by our filtering system to let us know and we will block it. Okay, question. Hi. 
exercise. Question regarding uh, uh, with the internet internet access. Uh, uh, what about uh, individual uh, student who may be at home being able to have uh, internet access into the classroom if they're home? I mean, I'm I'm disabled. Where uh, many years ago in the 60s, I was at the Mass Hospital School in Canton and they had set up with a uh, TV system uh, in the classrooms and you could uh, be part of, uh, of the class while you're uh, still in bed in the hospital as opposed to going to the high school on the campus. Is this uh, something that's uh, the system's capable of or not capable of. Also, does uh, Dragon system uh, work on the Mac for those uh, for those individuals who have difficulty typing? My feeling on that answer is because we actually do it at the high school right now. Mm -hmm. um, we have a couple of students who have pretty serious illnesses that require them to be hospitalized for periods of time. Mm -hmm. And so they Skype into the classroom and the teacher uses it. In fact, we had a teacher this year who went out on hip replacement and he was an advanced placement teacher and that was actually teaching the kids using Skype from his home. So it happens very actively. I know in the high school, the system is quite capable of handling it. And in terms of a Dragon system, it is there is software available for the Mac. And should we have a student that needed that, we could certainly load it on their computer. Okay. Is there any other questions? Oh, I, right down here. Just quick, um, I, I think I know the answer, but the $75 is per computer, right? I mean, I have two kids, so two times $75. And I just have one comment. This is going to make it very easy for me to monitor my kids' online usage because now she'll say, I'm doing homework. Whereas when she has a new computer, she won't be doing homework, you know, in her home computer anymore. So I'm excited about it. Good, thank you. Question? I, I do. I just have a quick follow up to the iTunes um, question. So they're going to be allowed to use iTunes on their laptops in school, and with that, we'll probably become earbuds. Are they going to be allowed to use the earbuds in school, too, while they're in the classrooms? Yeah, our students are using earbuds. The question was, will students be able to use earbuds and, um, with their iTunes account? Yes, and they use earbuds now, and we encourage um, parents, in fact, we started to encourage our teachers to put them on the supply list for uh, middle school, because it's not just at eighth grade that they're using these devices, they're using laptops in every classroom um, when they're available. Are there any No, they're actually going to be able to use their advice. The teachers are told, you know, again, teachers are very aware that. Oh, sorry. Right. The, well, they, you know, again, I think the issue we're bringing up is that, you know, kids were listening to their iPods and during their study hall and not doing their homework. I mean, when they are using their earbuds, they're using it because they're watching some instructional video or something that the teacher is asking them to use. Now, will there be a student who will try to switch off and listen to music? That's up to the teacher to monitor that. And we are asking the teachers to do that, and they do it quite successfully. Kids are still trying to use, because we have laptops in the high school now, and so kids will try to, you know, use it inappropriately at times, and the teachers are monitoring what they do. No, they will be able to use it, and it's it's a good thing to use it because you know they may be looking at, up different research, so they need to be able to hear it silently without hearing different movies going on at the same time. Facebook as an example is blocked because it's a distraction. Sure. Facebook is blocked <laughs> uh, because it's a distraction in school. Um, question? Was it up here? I, I just have a question with regard to financial hardship. If you have multiple students, and are there any accommodations for families that uh, are having financial hard time because it's 
if you have multiple kids, seventy-five dollars times three. Yes. yes. It's on an individual basis, so they would email the principals, and we would. That way, we, it's yeah, it's a personal issue. Yeah, I just had more uh, questions or comments about security. Um, you were saying that basically there's really uh, just an individual photo, uh, photo app that could use a webcam. Um, so really, if we wanted to, we could maybe put a piece of tape on that if we wanted to, right? All right. And you know, that's my, 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 my basic question is right around security. You know, in my house, I've got things secured, so things are encrypted, it's through a VPN, and now I'm bringing this device in, and, you know, I don't know how to, I, even if I knew how to run it, I really can't change anything on it. So I've got those kind of concerns. Um, I have concerns around, uh, you know, we, they were talking about the GPS, it's like, you know, Dr. Sanchiori said, well, we, we're not, you know, we're not interested in tracking people, but I can see where, a situation where someone, a police come into the Salem High School and said, this happened last night, and we suspect whatever. Can you please give us uh, the, the information on these kids, and where they were last night? I, what I'd like to know is, do you have written policies around security? Because, like I said, I already feel like this is a security hole popping into my system. <laughs> and I, I'm wondering what you have that's written, or do you have something that's written that would address uh, these issues. Yeah, online we have, uh, under the technology department, our network access policy, which goes through a whole bunch of different things. Also, when you go to the online payment section, we'll go through some of the things we covered tonight online as well. So I encourage you to read through those things. If you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to get into particulars on any one of those aspects. Um, but we try to address as many of the issues as we possibly can through our policies. Yep. Related to the police, we are not able to give that kind of information to the police that you suggest it's illegal to do that. So we have a memorandum of understanding with the police department. It doesn't work that way. We don't, they don't say jump and we say how high. Students have rights and we, it's just like their locker at school. So we publish that it is ours, it is the property of the Natick Public Schools, and they need to abide by the Natick Public School policies, and we police the our policies. Legal matters with the police are different. If students commit crimes, they go through their own process. We are not the, uh, it's like an illegal search and seizure. With They have rights over here as a citizen. School abridges some of those rights, but they're very defined and it is spelled out in our Memorandum of Understanding, which is a public document. I just have one last question. So if they have iPads or other ancillary devices, are they allowed to still use those and bring those into school? Um, and or if they had like a special project that they had to do and they needed a more powerful computer and they actually have that, are they able to bring that in in special cases? Well, our current policy is that the school district provides devices. We don't encourage bringing devices from home. They have to be pre-approved for obvious reasons. In a big environment like this, we don't want to have viruses, security concerns, or another. Um, so there's a variety of reasons why. So if there's a particular reason that you would want that, that we can't meet the need, then we would talk about that before allowing it. But what about iPhones? I mean, is the, you have access to the internet and everything on the ground. So what's your policy on that? I'm sorry, the cell phone policy? Well, I mean, your iPhone is a mobile device. Right. It's not just a telephone. It's also, you know, I can check my email online, iPhone, I can search the web, I can, you know, do other things that I need to get accomplished. So. It sounds like because like the new high schools can be all wireless and you want to have a secure wireless, like you know, I, I get that. But what if they do have an iPhone and they need to, I don't know, look up directions because they have to go somewhere after school and they have to map quest something or you know, figure something out. What's the policy for that? Because it sounds like they can't bring other devices to school, so does that count? Yeah. Well so let's separate the educational portion of the day and the 
day when the students have time to do those type of things. I think what Dennis was referring to during their, during their academic classes, we don't want other devices in there. When they're in the cafeteria, I'm gonna let Rose step in here because I'm not sure what, what the policy on study hall is, but I can speak for the cafeteria. They want to pull out their iPad or their iPhone to do work or things of that nature, they're welcome to do so. I didn't get the study hall, I didn't want to comment on that. No, but, uh, you know, we use the, you know, again, in the classrooms, we're looking for academic reasons to use the devices. So right now in the iPhone, teachers will ask the students to pull them out and they, put, they use poll everywhere. I mean, there are times when you can use the phone. Students use the phone through the school in the hallways and in the cafeteria, but if they have a laptop that they can use and they need to look up directions, they have the ability to look that up on their laptop. Um, so we would prefer that they use their laptops, but their iPhones, you know, again, they're responsible students. We want to treat them that way. And it's when they use it inappropriately, when they're texting their friends in class, that we're going to speak to them about it. At the middle level, we have a no cell phone, no iPhone policy, period. You come in, you power down, and you use your laptop. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons because we can't manage that particular device for young people. And you know, we have fifth graders and parents are giving 10 year olds that technology and we'd like to break from that during the school day. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yep, okay. Um, I do know that the, there are more advanced labs, computer labs coming in, very advanced, very specialized labs for the purposes it sounds like maybe your child is very much into multimedia filmmaking or something like that, yeah. robotics. Yep, yep. So there are labs specifically. Yep. Yeah. Well, you're going to be so psyched when you get into this new high school because there's labs specifically for designed with your child's delights in mind. So that, that I'm going to bet, bet, keep me honest on this, like find me later and let me know, but I'm going to bet that the labs are going to accommodate what she needs. Are there any other questions? Well, thank you. Thanks for coming.